Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley Forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Today's forum um, is presented in partnership with the School for Cultural and Social Transformation. The school, Transform for short, was founded in 2016, comprising the division of Ethnic, Gender, and Disability Studies. Transform seeks to advance intersectional inquiry on social justice practices. We would like to thank our streaming sponsor, AARP Utah, for making our virtual forums this fall possible. And we would also like to thank our media sponsor, KCPW, for recording and rebroadcasting our forums as part of the Hinckley Radio Hour. Finally, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge Professor Claudia Geist, whose hard work made this event possible. Thank you, Professor Geist. If you have questions for today's panelists, please enter them into the YouTube chat. Today's forum is Monumental Racism and will be moderated by Professor Edmund Fong, Chair of the Ethnics, Ethnics Studies Department and Professor of Political Science at the University of Utah. I will turn the time over to Professor Fong to introdu introduce our panelists. Hi, thank you, Anne. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'd like to thank the Hinckley Institute, our distinguished panelists, and Transforms Programming Committee for making this timely panel possible. Uh, I begin with the university's tribal land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is a traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Now, over the summer and building for years now, we have experienced a reckoning over many monuments and statues across the land. We have seen dramatic instances of demonstrations calling for their removal and of statues being toppled and defaced. Most of these monuments have been readily associated with the history of racism, slavery, settler colonialism, and genocide. Monuments to Confederate leaders, Christopher Columbus, or other statues that depict non-white peoples in objectionable ways. Critics would argue that removing such monuments merely erase our history, while supporters would argue that such monuments enshrine a history not to be honored, nor a history of their choosing. At stake, therefore, are implicit connections between monuments and collective memory. Do monuments simply serve as artifacts of the past? Or do they possess a living power to define and shape our present and future? How do monuments travel and perhaps structure in deeper ways our collective memory? For today's panel, we chose to foreground the Massasoit statue that adorns the Utah State Capitol grounds, among many other locations. According to the State Capitol website, the sculpture, quote, is a tribute to the Wampanoagus chief who greeted the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, end quote. As doctors Lisa Blee and Jean O'Brien uncover in their remarkable book, Monumental Mobility, the Massasoit statue has traveled, circulated, and been reproduced in multiple ways, raising questions about its power and enduring hold on our collective memory, especially in relation to our reckonings over settler colonialism and racism. While not the only monument that might attract scrutiny on the state capitol grounds, the Mormon Battalion monument also comes to mind, the mobility of the Massasoit statue across time and space invite us to take a, deep, a deeper look at the power of monuments and the fluid role they play in our collective memory. To examine this issue, we are fortunate to have three distinguished scholars. Dr. Lisa Blee is an associate professor at History at Wake Forest University. She is the author of Framing Chief Leshai, Narrative and the Politics of Historical Justice, and with Dr. Jean O'Brien, Monumental Mobility, the Memory Work of Massasoit, both from the University of North Carolina Press. 
In addition, Dr. Blee is the author of numerous articles that explore American Indian and settler politics, historical narratives, and commemorations in the U.S. West. Dr. Jean M. O'Brien, a citizen of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation, is the distinguished McKnight University Professor of History and Northrop Professor at the University of Minnesota. Dr. O'Brien is a co-founder and past president of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, a former president of the American Society of Ethnohistory, and a multitude of other distinguished professional service roles. Specializing in Native American and Indigenous Studies, Settler Colonialism, and U.S. Colonial History, Dr. O'Brien is the author of numerous books, co-edited volumes, and scholarly articles. In addition to the co-authored Monumental Mobility, she is the author of Firsting and Lasting, Writing Indians Out of Existence in New England from the University of Minnesota Press, and Dispossession by Degrees, Indian Land and Identity in Natick, Massachusetts, 1650 to 1790 by Cambridge University Press. Finally, Dr. Kevin Bruniel is professor of politics at Babson College in Massachusetts. He is the author of The Third Space of Sovereignty, The Postcolonial Politics of U.S. Indigenous Relations, and has a forthcoming book, Settler Memory, The Disavowal of Indigeneity in the Political Life of Race in the United States to be published in the Critical Indigeneity series at the University of North Carolina Press. He is of settler ancestry, born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Thank you to the three of you for joining our conversation today. Let's begin by having each of you introduce your work on monuments and collective memory, especially in relation to your book, Monumental Mobility, the Massasoit statue, or the broader connections you explore in your work between monuments and settler memory. We'll begin with Dr. O'Brien and Dr. Blee, followed by Dr. Bruni. Thank you very much for that introduction, Professor Fong. Um, so Dr. O'Brien and I will actually do this presentation together. Um, I will start, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> Jeannie will have the slides. So as Professor Fong mentioned in the, the introductory remarks, this is a, a particularly important moment to turn our attention to monuments. Countless anti-racism protests over monuments um, have accelerated after the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the end of May. And these events announce a really dramatic resurgence of struggle over memorialization to white supremacy. These events first spiked in the wake of the rally at Charlottesville in 2017 that resulted in the tragic death of Heather Heyer in an attack on the anti-racism protesters and then resumed with um, energy this past summer. The events in Charlottesville unfolded just as we were finishing our book, Monumental Mobility, the memory work of Massasoit. And in the book preface, we pause to suggest that the vital public engagement with monuments to white supremacy ought to be placed in dialogue with the monumental scaffolding around settler colonialism and historical figures such as Columbus. Monumental mobility is situated within the terrain of intense debate over the placement, displacement, and replacement of monuments to difficult histories. So we take as our case study the statue of Massasoit by sculptor Cyrus Dolan. Installed in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1921 to commemorate the tercentenary of the landing of the pilgrims, Dolan's statue was intended to memorialize the Poconocet Massasoit as a welcoming diplomat who negotiated the first treaty with the English. As well, the Massasoit was a participant in the, the mythical first Thanksgiving that stands at the center of American national origin stories. And brief note here, Massasoit is the Wampanoag word for leader. His actual name was Osamequin, meaning yellow feather. The statue was commissioned by the improved order of red men an all-white fraternal order hoping to demonstrate their patriotism through a bronze monument to Indians' purportedly peaceful embrace of the pilgrims. But Massasoit, the statue, did not remain only in Plymouth. In our book, we track the physical and narrative mobility of the Massasoit st story through its inception and its movement in the guise of several unauthorized reproductions of the statue to numerous locations in the U.S., including Salt Lake City and Provo, through a case of nefarious dealings in the fine art market which started in Provo, to illuminate how the statue's attachment to national origins did and did not move with the installations. 
taking as its point of departure the replication of an original statue with the status of fine art, our book examines its mobility from multiple angles. It analyzes the original inspiration for the monument, its design, installation in various locations, dedication ceremonies in diverse places over time, how to understand its reception by audiences, including indigenous ones, how it has and does figure in tourism, and importantly, how indigenous public intellectuals have intervened in historical narratives around settler colonialism read through the Massasoit statue. We ask, can the statue prompt viewers to reckon with the structural violence of settler colonialism in commemorative landscapes? Or does it further entrench celebratory narratives of national origins? What we found was that the meaning of the statue, along with the story of colonization and the founding of the nation it was commissioned to invoke, continues to evolve in Massachusetts and wherever the copies wound up. The force behind these changed meanings are twofold. Through the work of indigenous intellectuals and through the, the ways in which public history can reconfigure our re relationship to the present through engagement with the past. Our book suggests that monuments to settler colonialism ought to be part of a broader national conversation about the place and meaning of historical monuments and our task of reckoning with our colonial past and present. The historical memory surrounding the Massasoit suggests the rich potential of indigenous public historians to intervene in sanitized national nar narratives of origins. We can start with the setting of the first Massasoit installation. The memorial landscape in Plymouth, Massachusetts, including the Massasoit statue, helps those who traverse it to make meaning of New England's and the nation's history. The town of Plymouth was built directly atop the thousand-year-old Wampanoag village of Patuxet, a thriving community with an estimated population of 2,000 in the first decades of the 1600s. Villagers were in occasional contact with Europeans set on trading, slaving, or plundering along the coast, starting um, but starting in 1616, Patuxet was hit hard by waves of epidemics. When the Mayflower dropped anchor in the bay in 1620, the English colonists would have seen a village only recently evacuated as the survivors sought refuge elsewhere. When English colonists erected shelters amidst the existing houses and grave sites, they claimed the renamed place in honor of the home they left behind. Nearly half the Mayflower passengers died that first winter. They were buried at a mass grave near the waterfront, now called Coles Hill, upon which the commemorative statue of the Wampanoag leader was erected 300 years later. This is a story about a place undergoing terrible suffering and loss. Yet the Massasoit statue and the Thanksgiving myth that later attached to this place cast a positive glow. This is a place composed of welcoming Indians and well-meaning pilgrims, making Plymouth into the birthplace of the nation. It is the story of peaceful colonization that the improved order of Redmond hoped to celebrate and cast in bronze. It is a classic example of what Kevin Roniel calls settler memory. In his words, quote, the practices of memory that allow those in the United States to both see and to not see indigenous people and settler colonialism to remember and forget at the same time. A tourist to Plymouth today can easily access this pilgrim-centered story as we did on our research trips by gazing upon a diminutive rock we are instructed to venerate, taking a tour with the pilgrim clad guide who insists the Pawtuxet gave their land away because they no longer wanted it, not true, by listening to a visitor center volunteer explain that all the native residents had died off. We actually heard them say that. And that by perusing the town's gift shops stuffed with depictions of happy pilgrims and Indians sharing a feast. The memorial landscape and dominant narratives of its history insist on maintaining a cognitive distance from the past that insulates visitors from uncomfortable truths, even as they purport to bring visitors closer to history by connecting them to hallowed ground. Yet as we come upon the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's arrival at Pawtuxet, actually last week, Wampanoag and other indigenous public intellectuals have brought new energy to their engagement with this landscape to craft a more complicated and coherent narrative of New England's past. Unlike most of the memorial landscape in Plymouth, which freezes the town as an English place, these educators create ways to introduce visitors to long excluded experiences and perspectives. Tourists can now join Ted Turner on his native Plymouth tours, where Pawtuxet becomes visible in the crowded memorial landscape on the waterfront can be reevaluated from an indigenous perspective. They can visit the traveling exhibit Pimashpi Wampanoag Paula Peters helped create or view her videos about Wampanoag perspectives on that history on the Plymouth 400 website. 
Visitors may feel discomfort that comes with new awareness of more complex reality and history, but such an experience with historical memory does the work of closing the cognitive distance between the past and the present. We see the Massasoit, we see Massasoit the statue as an important touchstone in public history that sets up a complex push and pull dynamic around the problem of historical memory. The improved order of Redmen erected it as a manifestation of their own historical distancing from the violence of the colonial encounter. And yet, as with all monuments, meaning comes from engagement with the statue when the story is intended to fix and bronze. Our book asks, how effective has the Red Men's project been in the long run? What is the place of the Massasoit in time, in space, and in narratives of the nation? Does the statue secure the distance intended by the Red Men in the historical memory of this imagined foundational moment? What meaning do people make of the history in those distant locations where casts of Massasoit came to be mounted? Salt Lake City? Provo, Kansas City, Chicago, Spokane, and Dayton. That's a tease for the book. To what extent do observers hold on to the historical distancing implicit in the narrative of the Massasoit that so profoundly elides the violence of settler colonialism? What we found illustrates how multivalent historical meaning making can be in divergent places. This particular set of monuments to the Massasoit, including the Day of Mourning plaque added beside the Massasoit statue, open a fascinating window onto the process of historical memory formation or the crucial work that physical location and cognitive distance perform on historical memory. In these public history locations, indigenous peoples insist on a reckoning with the past and the present that refuses narratives of frozen Indians in a place sanitized with the violence and trauma of settler colonialism. In all of these locations, historical memory is contested rather than resolved for once and for all. Historical meaning making is revealed as dynamic, interactive, unsettled, open to interpretation. Indigenous people use the statute to explain settler colonialism as a structure. Indigenous dispossession set loose at that moment and continuing as a system of oppression rather than an event, the peace treaty or mutual defense alliance that it's meant to commemorate depending on your perspective. And those, in these senses, Massasoit opens a window not just on how to think about the distance between the historical moment and the present, but also the distance between the very different non-Indian and indigenous projects of commemoration. For indigenous peoples, there's a double distancing operating. The distance between the memorialized moment and now, and the distance between native and non-native willingness to embrace uncomfortable histories. They refuse to be frozen in this narrative, but instead insist that the past be reckoned with in a way that includes their perspectives on history in the ongoing ramification of their lives under settler colonialism. Imagined from these multiple vantage points, Massasoit finds a place in a highly mobile interpretive terrain that unsettles rather than fixes historical narratives in bronze and stone. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to um, the Hinckley Institute, uh, Professor Geist, uh, Professor Fong, and all the students who worked on this. Um, and it's an honor to be on, the, on this panel with uh, Dr. Blee and Dr. O'Brien, whose work um, I know and respect and to learn a lot from. What I'll try to do here is offer a sense of what my work has been about, especially sort of, uh, I've come from political theory and American politics and the politics uh, behind memory that's really driven my work since the third space of sovereignty. So in terms of what drives my work, which is sort of part of the opening um, uh, uh, talk I'm gonna give here is I think that the politics of memory is really what's fascinated me the last 10 to 15 years. And what does that mean? Um, it means the relationship of the past to the present in political discourse, institutions, public life, and the contestations over collective memories. What defines a people? Now, there is no a people. There's contestations of who the people are who's included, who's excluded, what does freedom mean for that people, often based upon the unfreedom and sometimes the elimination of another people. Um, and this invocation of the past in my analysis never stops. It's constantly reproduced, um, I say habitually, not even consciously. The past is always with us and in that sense, it's never really past, it's very much present. But what do we talk about when we talk about the past? Um, it's historical facts, but it's a, it's a mixture of myth memory and history. And the lines be these, between these blur. And I think that the negotiation of these blurring lines between history, memory, and myth are part of the politics. Um, in terms of memorialization, literally, I think the one study I've done in this regard, and I'll get to my larger project now, but the, I assume, but the one study I've done 
is on the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, DC. Um, and I set this, I became interested in this, not only because of the memorial itself, but I think it in many ways connects to the work of Dr. Blee and Dr. O'Brien, which is the movement and traveling of the memory, the collective memory of Dr. King himself and his political legacy, which went from a rather radical figure in the 1960s who was very unpopular to one who is now only second in popularity to Mother Teresa in the 20th century. As a politics of liberal multiculturalism and inclusion um, has defanged a form of radical racial and anti-capitalist politics, MLK has come to reflect that type of politics, become a mirror in which a society, a liberal multicultural society that wants to focus on inclusion instead of uh, based uh, inclusion into an American nation that does not challenge its fundamental premises, utilizes Dr. King to reaffirm those premises. And so I very, became very interested in how the memorial itself in many ways reaffirmed these form of liberal instead of more radical positionings. Um, and there were a lot of contests over in particular with, with the memorial itself, the type of quotations uh, that would be used. Some of his radical ones such as calling the United States government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world was not included in that collection of, of quotations you'll find at the MLK Memorial. So my experience of the memorial from a distance um, was one of not so much critique, but an interesting way in which certain forms of contestation over uh, US race politics, it plays out a little bit in the way this memorial was constructed and the debates around it. I wanna contrast that or at least put it in the relationship of my experience of going to the memorial in the, in the first weekend it was opened, first three days it was opened a number of years ago. And that was a different experience. And it was the experience of people's relationship to it being very powerful. It was a very diverse group of people there, a lot of African-Americans in the, in the area at the um, memorial site in DC um, who were having very powerful expressions of, of, of um, recognition and of a sense of, of belonging in some sense on the Washington Mall that we should never recognize um, um, an African-American to this degree, and certainly not somebody who was not a, a, in a um, position of government. Um, and so part of the lesson there was, of course, that monuments don't speak for themselves. They're engaged in a relationship to, or people are engaged in a relationship to them, which I think might be the conversation we have later about contests, uh, contestations against memorials, the effort to topple them, to behead them, and as, as occurred here with Columbus in Boston, that memorials like facts don't speak for themselves. They're engaged in a type of discursive community with the larger public. And so that's part of the way in which I engage in uh, the politics of memory is to see it as a type of discursive terrain in which our politics um, are continually reproduced, sense of particular alignments and realignments are engaged through how people understand their relationship to the past. Specifically for my contemporary work, um, as, as I was so generously quoted by Dr. Blee, I'm now on a, in a project that's now hopefully to conclusion, I, I knock wood, called Settler Memory, um, that is going to be uh, published in the wonderful series, Critical Indigeneities, uh, the University of North Carolina Press, in which my editors are Dr. O'Brien herself and Kehlani Kawanui. Um, and that project is really one in which I'm trying to engage with this question of how indigenous peoples and settler colonialism are both sort of remembered and also disavowed, not forgotten, there and not there at the same time. And I think um, uh, Dr. Blee and Dr. O'Brien's study um, itself shows that. And I'm trying to get into the meaning of what's going on there, not only generally, but also in terms of what it means for contemporary race politics. Um, and this complex and what I see fraught relationship between of, of race and indigeneity, of white supremacy and settler colonialism, of enslavement and genocide, of labor relations and labor conflicts and land relations and land conflicts. These particular categories are often split in our historical uh, constructs, in our memories, and I think it has a negative impact or a limiting impact on our politics. And so the question, the larger question I end up asking often in the um, book is what is the splitting of these historical and contemporary subjects and the disavowal of indigeneity and settler colonialism um, due to our politics, separating, for example, questions of labor from those of land, due to our politics, especially race politics and our politics around indigeneity. What does it limit? What does it contain? What conversations and what engagements and contentions does it keep us from having? Because these seem, some of these issues, such as those, those around land, seem to be questions of the past instead of very much being questions of the present. So in that context, how does the implication of the past 
shape and contain our sense of the important issues at stake politically. And so when I see um, engagements with and protests against uh, monuments, I see an effort of people to refuse to leave these particular contestations in the past, um, to say that this is not about erasing the past, but actually centering the past in the present to make these contentions very much contemporary and to build different types of coalitions, different types of opportunities, different types of worlds out of engaging with and in many ways challenging, toppling or replacing these particular narratives and to imagine a better world. Um, and so my, and my, my particular work, Settler memory, memory, is really about trying to engage with what I deem to be popular narratives, especially in liberal or left discourses about race, around the role of Bacon's rebellion in the 17th century, around the role of reconstruction, around the focus in race politics, around labor issues, with an inattention to land issues, and the way in which indigenous politics is sort of there somewhat, but often marginalized, put in the footnotes, and never quite addressed as deeply constitutive of our entire political terrain today. And looking at what it would mean if we actually not did, did more than just simply include indigenous politics into our contemporary um, uh, political uh, discourse and realms, because that's more of a liberal multicultural move, but actually engage seriously with the type of contentions around land and sovereignty and forms of freedom that are not best based upon liberal capitalist modes of freedom and really engage with those as how to understand the problems with our contemporary world and ways to build um, a better world. And before I stop my um, presentation, I just wanna note one thing in terms of the politics of memory. Um, so today I became a US citizen um, earlier today. And among the things I received, um, I did receive my um, official documentation, but I also received a letter from President Donald Trump. It wasn't affirming that he won the election by a lot, but I'm sure he still holds to that. It did involve this paragraph, which I'd like to read, and then I'll uh, turn over the uh, Zoom to a larger conversation. In the middle of this letter that begins, Dear Fellow American, which I now am, although I'd say fellow USian, um, the letter says, although you, though you and your fellow naturalized citizens hail from many places and come from many backgrounds, as Americans, you all now bear the torch of American history, inheriting a legacy of common heroes, values, and traditions that stretch back through the centuries. This American legacy is now your legacy. This history is now your history. Our traditions are now your traditions. You now share the duty to pass the legacy of liberty, history, and tradition to the next generation of Americans. It is the biggest paragraph in this letter, and it's all about the relationship of me, a new American citizen, to this history to this past, to these common heroes. And so I think part of the work we're all doing is to really challenge the notion of who are presumed to be these common heroes, to talk about what this legacy means, and to, degree, to ask what sort of politics and political boundaries and political commitments it authorizes and presumes, and what sort of political possibilities does it contain? Does it, I'm sorry, does it exclude? Does it refuse? And sometimes does it just deny and eliminate? And that's sort of the overarching uh, politics of my concern um, with the relationship between the past and the present. And with that, I'll turn it back to um, our uh, moderator uh, for the next stage of the conversation. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for such a wonderful you know, presentation and comments. I mean, I do have a few sort of themes that I'd like to tease out. I think that's you know, uh, drawn from all of your comments and in your work um, before we sort of open it up to you know, questions from the audience. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm struck by, you know, all of your work is uh, sort of how memory is, or, or the issue around monuments really opens up a kind of active, you know, sort of space of, you know, contestation, as you put it, Kevin, um, you know, the subtitle of, of the book Monumental Mobility is the memory work. Um, and so, you know, there, there are highlighting sort of or, or foregrounding how we react or interact with monuments and less so about the monuments themselves. Um, so I'm, I, I'm curious if, you know, all three of you could sort of, you know, maybe expand a little bit more about maybe how should people sort of interact or respond to, uh, you know, monuments um, that, you know, predated them, obviously. 
Um, you know, uh, what sort of guidance do you have? Is there ethics around sort of memory work that, you know, uh, people should sort of uh, keep in mind as they're sort of navigating kind of the landscape they find themselves in? And I'd love to have this more of a kind of conversation between the three of you. So yeah, please take it away. Well, I mean, I guess one of the things that we were most interested in with the Massasoit monument and its, its mobility, which is a complicated story, is the question of engagement itself. What meaning do people make of monuments? Uh, and so one of the things that we did in our research was actually do interviews with passersby of the monuments in each of their locations to get try to get an idea about what they were seeing or thinking. And of course, that varied really a lot by location. Uh, and I, just to, to say one thing about the original, we saw the, the new marker next to the original monument itself. And one of the things that we found there that was interesting is that people who bothered to stop and read that new marker, we, we saw that they were grappling with how to make meaning of the statue and its history. And that was another element of the mobility that we thought we were seeing was that people were taking that meaning home with them. And they were thinking harder about the story of origins that sanitizes conflict and settler colonialism and all those kinds of things. And so uh, I, I would just start there in terms of having a conversation. I, I would love it if Lisa would talk about, especially about the Utah locations because she actually spent more time there than I did. We, we did a lot of our research trips together but she for complex reasons ended up doing some of those on her own. Yeah. Um so part of the, um, the research method, I guess, of this, of this book that we were writing was to just talk to passerby. And we had um, a, a, about, what was it, four questions that we asked of everyone about whether um, they knew who was depicted in the statue, whether they knew why it was there, and um, whether they thought it belonged there. Um, but it was really when people started kind of talking off the cuff that we really got to know um, like the the texture of their relationship to the past, how they're engaging with the statue. So um, yeah, in Plymouth with the, in combination with that day of mourning plaque, right? We could really start to see how people were not thinking just about, you know, checking off a list of all of the tourist destinations. So they had to go up to the top of Coles Hill, but there, I think everyone who looked at that um, plaque also said, oh, there's another story. Right, whether they agreed with it or not, it, they weren't quite there yet in most cases, but they knew about another story, right? And they knew that this was a, a, a contentious, not finished <laughs> story, even though they're looking at um, memorials in bronze. So that was really important. And then in terms of Utah, um, so the research that I, that I did at the state capitol grounds in Salt Lake City, uh, was I, it was it was really fun first of all because most of the people I talked to were actually um, tourists who were there just to look at statues, or um, to to tour the grounds, or state legislators and, and researchers who were there to to aid in the legislative process. And the stories that I got from people were so interesting. There were a lot of personal connections made. Many people assumed, without looking at the at the plaque, that uh, the, that the statue was meant to memorialize Ute people or more generally the, um, the indigenous people of the area. And they all believed that that kind of memorial was fitting and appropriate on state grounds, state capital grounds. Um, but I also got a lot of other family stories, um, people talking about how their families, their, their Mormon families way back had adopted um, native children into their families. And they've got, uh, you know, Mormon families are, um, kind of braided into the, the land and indigenous history of that place. And so this is a constant reminder when they pass by that statue to think about their own family histories. And, um, and I met uh, Navajo folks who were very proud in the similar way as Pro Professor Bernil talked about with the MLK statue, um, going to the, um, to the, you know, the dedication. Um, they were very proud to see an indigenous uh, figure on on government 
property, right, in this place of prominence, um, whether or not he was Navajo or Ute or Massachusetts <laughs> or Wampanoag, right? So, um, so there was a lot of kind of personal connections that were that were brought out through that statue that I found really illuminating. Um, so far from, you know, the 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 place that was supposed to be the source of that story about Massasoit and why he was significant. Um, yeah, I don't know, Jeannie, is there more that we should discuss on that? I see that there's a question. Um, Professor Fong, is this a good time to address the question about why the statue is there? In sure, yeah, feel free. So um, the, the sculptor Cyrus Dolan was, was born and raised in Springville, um, Utah. So down kind of in the southern tip of the, of the valley. And um, after the dedication ceremony in Plymouth in 1921, um, he he dedicated, or he did, I guess he he went with his family to the dedication ceremony of the, the um, plaster cast of Massasoit, which he gave to the state of Utah to put into the Capitol building as a donation. Um, it was a new Capitol building that had just been completed in 1916. They didn't have any money left in the budget for art, and so. This was his kind of act of love to his natal state, even though he'd made it as a, a, a big time East Coast sculptor by that point. And so um, it was really because of um, his generous donation that the, the statue stood in the state capitol until the 1950s when um, there was enough uproar about the, the presence of this um, outsider as, um, as some political leader saw it. Um, that money was raised to, to make a, a bronze cast from that model and to put it outside. So that's kind of the story of, of how we have um, the bronze cast outside on the state capitol grounds. And then that, um, that original was sent to Provo, Utah, to BYU, where it was then copied um, posthumously and illegally. And um, different copies were sold, and that's how it was spread across the country. And now the um, that original plaster mold is still in the Springville Museum of Art. So there was not a lot of discussion about whether um, Massasoit belonged in Utah um, at the time that it was dedicated or and and um, donated in the 1920s. Sorry, I'm reading the questions. Did you want to say something, Kevin? Uh, sure, I guess I'll just, uh, I see some uh, great questions popping up here. I just, in terms of the ethics of engagement, I, I guess a couple of thoughts, and maybe this speaks to the one asking about um, engaging with people who uh, these concepts are new, new interpretations. But um, but Beth, in terms of the experience of, of memorials, is uh, going back a little bit to the MLK experience, which is, I, I have to say, I didn't go in with a research plan, which happens with me a lot. Um, but I, I ended up talking to a lot of people, not as a plan, but conversations. And really, it was less about the relationship to the memorial than the civil rights movement, right? So there became a conversation about their family or themselves in relationship to that. And the civil rights movement was being acknowledged. And so then my own sense of what this meant had to be much more fluid and engaging with the people in the space. And I think that's part of the ethics, which is to not allow the memorial to, to become hegemonic in terms of its reading, to actually engage with how people are trying to figure out their relationship to it. And to connect to that just uh, a little bit in terms of a more radical type of politics, I've been involved with a number of Indigenous Peoples Day and anti-Columbus Day movements and marches here in, in Massachusetts. And thankfully the Columbus Day statue is now toppled. But a few years ago we were there and we were at a, we were at a march on Indigenous Peoples Day down to the Columbus Day um, statue. And the police got there ahead of us and they had surrounded it with tape that said, uh, um, you can't enter, it's a crime scene, which was a beautiful little like unintentional type of memorial in which we ended up celebrating and taking pictures. And there was this sort of relationship where the police had their own way in which they were protecting the statue, but the crime scene sort of underscored our entire point politically. Um, and so there's, it was, it was obviously we, we were there to protest its very existence, but also there's a way in, in these sort of, sort of radical engagements 
that the very thing that, that the state is defending um, starts to lose its undergirding once you realize that they put in something unintentional about the history of this crime scene. So I think there's sort of part of the point is an openness politically to how people engage with these and how the state engages with them. Uh, in terms of sort of new interpretations, I, somebody mentioned here teaching, and that's kind of what I was going to say in uh, how I engage with these issues in my classrooms. And it's building a lot of, on, on Dr. O'Brien's work, such as in First Thing and Last Thing, where I ask students to do their own research, uh, going looking at particular memorials and, and even small signifiers in their hometowns. And things that, as they say in, in my book, are not so much conscious memory, but habituated memory. We know that street always has that name, right? Or the town has that name. Well, where does Massachusetts come from? Where does Massachusetts come from? Where does Natick come from? And the students, my students, tend to quite get quite interested because they're learning more about their town, but they're also digging into a particular corner memorial, something that, that doesn't, that's been sitting there getting rusty and it doesn't seem to mean anything. It's something happened in 1790, and suddenly they have an engagement with it. And I think it can be an exciting for students possibility of learning something new about their own relationship to land and place in history. And um, and one, one um, you know, uh, Dr. Fong began with a land acknowledgement. And of course I began my classes with a land acknowledgement. And what I do as one paper assignment is to have the students come up with their own land acknowledgement for their land of their hometown, right? And so it won't necessarily be Wellesley Mass, but wherever you're from, what would a land acknowledgement look like? Who are the people's historically there? Where are they now? What, what's that history? And I think there's opportunities for this for students and I always have a number of students take this on and get quite excited about it sometimes they'll, they'll suddenly engage with the names of their their local high school sports teams and so there's lots of opportunities for them to suddenly take which what had become sort of just passed down habituated memory that they hadn't thought about it and turn it into a type of historical engagement um, and I think that's that's a great opportunity in terms of teaching that I found many of my students quite excited about uh, so I think that's one approach um, in terms of just sort of get, engaging with people who are who have never thought about this particular ma material or this memory that much at all. So I mean th that opens up a question I have. I've been you know what I'm hearing is that you know we need to engage with monuments, we need to historicize them, we need to sort of open up our own sort of reflective engagements with them. Um, but you know that seems in tension with kind of the politics of our current monument removal moment where it's you know about you know removing them toppling them erasing them perhaps you know so i i'm i'm curious to see how you navigate sort of this tension between sort of the politics or strategies uh, by which you know people today counter sort of the the legacies of these monuments on our collective memory uh, in ways that, you know, maybe, you know, uh, foreshorten or shut down sort of the kind of deeper engagements that I, th I hear all three of you are um, uh, discussing. You know, I would just jump in here and, and, and pick up on Kevin's point about the, the police tape. That's a great story. I didn't know that. But um, I wanted to add that into the mix because partly what we're seeing about the fear, the fear over over monuments today is people are mad about property destruction it's, as much as it is about the monuments themselves. I mean, one of, the, one of the points we make in our book is that not very far below the surface of the urge to commemorate, commemorate period, but through a monument is the desperation that something's gonna be forgotten, right? I mean, why do it otherwise? And, you know, absent signage and engagement with monuments, what do you have but the risk of a landscape littered with things that don't mean anything? Right, which a lot of monuments are like that. They're everywhere if you really start paying attention. And so there, it's, it's, it's a complicated mix of things. And, and right now it's so swept up into the racial and social and every kind of rec political reckoning that we're grappling with right now. So um, I think it's hard to disentangle all of these things, but you know, racial capitalism, I think is really central to a lot of it. And um, you know, then you have to think about what kinds of monuments. We, there's the mass produced monuments to white supremacy from the 20s and 50s. They don't really mean that much in terms of art or who knows what else, except for white supremacy. And then there's something like the Massasoit white monument, which actually is fine art, which makes it a little bit more complicated. It's also, it's also a monument that 
doesn't really have much meaning for indigenous people in, in New England, but it's a place of protest. So it's meaningful that way. So it's, it's flat, it's complicated. Yeah, I would I would just add to that that um, the question about a kind of a um, an ethic of um, engagement it's it's a tough one but I think it should always include um, a place based historical research right we need to know what like who created the monument and when and what other stories happened in this place that are being hidden obscured. Um, kind of erased because there's a big monument there, right? So I, I think it, it, I guess that's the, the only kind of driving ethic I can think of is we need information that's inclusive and historicized for each, for each monument, right? I don't think there, we should have a, a rule about if it, if, um, if it's too, a particular person, then it should be removed, right? I think these are very um, community-based discussions that need to happen. I think the other part of the contemporary politics now, especially when you see emergent and more vocal uh, white supremacy, um, white militias, is this you know stoked fear of from a, a, a part of, of of white America of being replaced of being replaced by outsiders and insiders, right? And so what is the toppling of a memorial? Let's say, okay, we're gonna get rid of Columbus Day and we're gonna have Indigenous Peoples Day. We're gonna get rid of Confederate statues and we're gonna paint, we're gonna paint Black Lives Matter on the road, right? So the, the fear of replacement from, from um, migrating others, from the, the diminishment of the, the purported diminishment of the uh, uh, demographic domination of the white population, um, the increasing presence of a black radical politics that's gone from liberal to radical, I'd say in the last 10 to 15 years, talking about things like defunding the police and talking opening about racial capitalism. I think that indigenous politics is much more present and centered than say 10 to 15 years. I think you match that with the sort of white supremacist fear of the great replacement by, by non-white others, by, by uh, you know, I think it's a white settler fear of, of replacement that is stoked by a leader who talks about making America great again, invoking a time of domination. I think that the memorials in it, and as Dr. Glee and Dr. O'Brien pointed to very importantly, like the Charlottesville centered around Robert E. Lee, right? And so it's the replacement of the memorial that I think signifies in many ways, the replacement of, of a, a particular demographic group of people's dominance. And I do think that that contestation is very real. I mean, I think it's not so much replacement as a people being here, but it's certainly in terms of those narratives and those particular statuses and standing being openly challenged. And, um, and I think that's why the stakes become quite high in that regard, that a lot of investment is um, in those particular statues as, as both representing and also reproducing a type of, of literally standing in the public square as, as defining this space. And so, um, you know, you might've seen images of people trying to paint over Black Lives Matter signs. I mean, Black Lives Matter just on the road. So I think that there is this notion of who's going to be able to define some of the dominant narratives of who, who are the peoples, and I say that in a plural sense, of this space. Um, and, and I think that is also why things become so intentionally violently con contested around memorials and statues and, and, and the defining of, of, of public memory in the, in, in the public space. You know, Kevin, I think we can tie that directly to your letter from President Trump <laughs> about the narratives and, you know, and, and his historical commission that he, you know, wants to, to found. I mean, that, that's all connected, right? It's all part of the same tangled mess, you know? And I don't know, just one other thing to point out is when the Columbus statue went down here in St. Paul, you know, in the neighboring city where George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police, um, that was organized by, you know, lots of lots of native activists. Um, but there was an arrest there and a native man is being charged with a felony. So we'll see what happens with that. Um. So another question around kind of the politics of our current moment. I mean, is there a tension between sort of reckoning with monuments that are associated with racism versus monuments that are associated with settler colonialism? 
I mean, you, I think this is a thread in all of your work as well. Uh, you know, I, I think for many Utahns, you know, the Massasoit uh, statue, you know, it seems like in a categorically different, you know, um, um, uh, place than say other statues, say of Confederate leaders or things like that. And, and I think um, in the demonstrations we've seen, they usually are, you know, uh, uh, demonstrations against statues that are more readily associated with sort of, you know, racism um, or, you know, uh, where there is a kind of clear connection. But it sounds like, you know, there are many statues that sort of enshrine, you know, mythologies around settler colonialism that, you know, are harder to kind of bring to awareness, harder to you know, sort of challenge. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm curious to see kind of what, how you relate, you know, sort of settler colonial, colonialism and racism in sort of our coll collective memory and, and monuments around them. Well, I would say that the, the Columbus monuments everywhere are under siege, right? So there's that. And um, I think of the Oñate monument in Santa Fe that you know got his left leg chopped off and for a number of years and now has come down, right? And so these are these are monuments to invasion and violence, the violence of settler colonialism. So, um, but you know, I think you know as Native people, we're always on the margins, and I think par I, partly the noise is much more muted because there are fewer of us in, and I guess, you know, that's just for me, partly about the dem demographics of it. I mean, there, I mean, there's also like the pioneer woman and man went down on the University of Oregon campus, right? So that, that's another kind of, those are kind of monuments that you have to go one step further, I guess, in, in trying to grapple with. I'm, I'm not sure if that's, that's just a take that, that I'll throw out there. I'm, I'm thinking about the um, indigenous public intellectuals that we spoke to who were putting together their traveling exhibit. You know, they're, they're adding um, one panel every year starting in, in 2014. And the point was to just, was not to um, replace or um, tell all <laughs> settlers, um, US citizens that their, that their history is myth, is myth and wrong, but to make sense of, of the past, right? Of, of American history, of US history, um, their contention was, it makes no sense if you don't include Wampanoag history, right? And so it's this way of, of um, challenging and upending it without, um, without, I guess, a direct, um, I guess the, the threat of, of beheading or throwing it away, right? Um, there's a, a, a greater nuance that, that comes in their, um, their way of, of approaching this, this memorial problem of settler colonialism. Um, so yeah, maybe that's kind of what, what Jeannie is talking about, right? There's just the, a, a, a different approach that requires some unsettling of the premise of, of US history. It's a different kind of work than, than looking at slavery, which we you know, have, been, have all agreed right, is, is a problem and is negative. And I think uh, building upon that, uh, sort of directly building on that, I think of uh, also the work of Philip Deloria in Playing Indian and talking about how Playing Indian is a fundamental part of the construction of American identity at the founding, whether we're going through the Boston Tea Party up to the notions of authenticity connected in the late 19th century. And so disaggregating this relationship of the memory of settler colonialism from the memory of being American. And I think it becomes actually a harder uh, de-threading a little bit. I mean, I've had uh, at various points on social media and other places in the Boston area posted things about the problem of the Boston Pier uh, tea Party and had liberals come back at me like with like, you know, it's a great moment. And yes, you know, we understand, but but it's so hard for a, a lot of folks to pull apart this history of what it means to be American without talking about the types of appropriations of indigenous identity. And I think that's where 
some of the effort to just sort of disavow and say, well, yes, that was part of the past or to turn it into and said, well, we're not being racist like Confederates, we're honoring, right? So you think about the ways in which the defense of sports teams came about. And so you have to sort of, my experience is you have to sort of take that on straight on and say, well, when, when you say honoring, where do the people you are honoring feel honored? <laughs> Or is it that you are deciding they're honored? What, what kind of work is going on there in terms of you engaging? And I think that um, Jeannie O'Brien's book, First Thing and Last Thing, gets to this very well about replacement narratives in the other way, right? You replace in the other way, and then you say, now we are the people who are here. We have replaced the ind indigenous people. And I, in my book, I talk about sports names as being one of those types of replacement narratives in which you say, no, all these names are not denigrating. We're honoring them. We want to, you know, why would we have terrible names to be great teams on the, on the football field or whatever? And I think that that's, that becomes a little tougher conversation than saying, well, Robert E. Lee was a racist and a slaveholder. Okay, yes. But now we have to have this conversation, even about Columbus, right? And then we have to have this conversation. And I think the thing that I thought that, that's been encouraging is to see how the sort of radical black politics of Black Lives Matter, indigenous politics have sort of come together in this regard. I mean, there's no doubt that the Washington football team name that has been the work of indigenous feminists for decades got pushed over uh, into the end zone, if I may use that metaphor, by Black Lives Matter, right? They finally pushed it, but it, that was decades of work by indigenous feminists to get there, but the connection to Black Lives Matter ma mattered to get that accomplished. And the uh, most recent um, Indigenous Peoples Day event I was at uh, last month, obviously the Columbus statue is gone, but we, we connected with people, um, Black Lives Matter activists at Faneuil Hall, because they want Faneuil Hall, the na that name changed because Faneuil was a slave owner. So I'm seeing connections of people starting to bring these together. And that's the encouraging part of this discourse. But certainly I think it's a more complicated conversation around settler colonial memory. You have to see, you have to talk about the way people's own settler perceptions that somehow they're not engaged in racism, they're engaging in some form of honoring for people who are no longer there or no longer as relevant. And that's that is a nut can, that can be cracked, but I think it's more complicated than sort of a liberal notion of what racism means that, that needs to be addressed, but it's not really, that's a different type of conversation. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, I think we have a few more minutes, a couple minutes, if there is one last question from uh, those tuning in um, pretty quickly. If not, um, you know, I think we're about at the end of our time. So if there are any sort of last thoughts or remarks uh, from um, any of you? You know, just to build on what Kevin just said briefly, um, in Minneapolis, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and, and the demonstrations and violence that erupted in complicated ways out of that, um, the, the AIM patrol was not reborn, but rediscovered. and. And one of the things that was fascinating about that was the AIM patrol, that, which came out of defending indigenous people against police violence based on black patrols in the, in the late 60s and 70s. Um, they were there to defend not just native people, native properties, but everybody in this very, very diverse neighborhood. And it was, there's some really, really important and, and wonderful um, collaborations around Black Lives Matter and American Indian activism and other other activisms in Minneapolis right now that are, are, are part of that as well. It's just a thought. So there's one last question uh, from the audience and I think it's a good one to end on. How do we move forward and confront the harsh misrepresentations of history in the US in a way that can benefit us all going forward? Will this always remain contentious? I mean, I think it will always remain contentious if you're in a white supremacist settler colonial state it, until you have more radical change. I think it's going to remain contentious. And I'm not one to incline towards like we can all be in this together and all get the same out of it. I think there's going to be different ways in which radical change is going to have to have certain certain notions of standing and status be challenged fundamentally. I do think, though, there's possibilities for forms of convergence and coalition. I mean, one of the books I taught this past semester was um, Dina Julia Whitaker's As Long As Grass Grows, which is a wonderful book connecting environmental politics and indigenous politics and talks about the tensions, but also the possibility for coalitions. And so I think there are possibilities where you take those particular contentions 
and see them for what they are, but also see people who can find common forms of ground in terms of issues around the environment, around labor conditions, around the role of capitalism. I think you're seeing forms of, of convergence for people to work together. Um, but I, still, that, that doesn't mean you're not gonna have people who are who want to exploit land and want to engage in capitalist extractive policies and want to defend white supremacy. So I don't see a time when it won't be contentious, but I don't think it necessarily has to be. But I also think there's lots of opportunities that I think we a, a few of us articulated that coalitions are already going on on the ground to sort of speak to each other and support and think of a of how to create a better world than the one we're in right now. I, I'm having the same things happen in my classroom and um, also just a real appetite. I, I have a lot of faith in young people. There's a real appetite for grappling with this history. And, you know, for example, the word genocide in talking about Indian history is, you know, that's something that students want to talk about now five years ago. That would have been, well, why are you using the word genocide? Um, and, and, you know, young people, as I sh they should be, are really concerned about the environment and climate change and all of these kinds of things and about, about racial equality. So I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I think, end up on a hopeful note with that. Yes, it's always going to be contentious as long as white supremacy is there, but I think there's an appetite for taking it on among young people. All right. Um, any last words, Lisa, before we call it? All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien, Dr. Blee, and Dr. Bruniel, and thank you to the Hinckley Institute for uh, putting this panel together. Um, I think I, the, the key message is that, yeah, I mean, monuments are always, you know, part of a contentious living memory. And one of the phrases that I've always liked from um, uh, the political theorist Ann Norton was that, you know, we're always engaged in the democratic election of our past. And so I think, and that, as we know, obviously, in recent weeks is, uh, is uh, um, not a smooth process uh, in any way. So uh, with that, thank you uh, for tuning in to our panel today.